welcome as this week we look to the third Sunday or weekend of the Lenten period. We're moving through kind of quickly already. And the readings this uh, time come, the first reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. The uh, <clears throat> second reading is from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, uh, actually chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. And the gospel comes this time from John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 25. In fact, we will see now as we uh, move through the, the rest of this Lenten time that we are going to get sections of John's gospel, as I mentioned uh, earlier, because Mark, being our guide this year, tends to be shorter. Therefore, we need to find material that will kind of help us uh, uh, each Sunday reflect on some mystery or aspect, certainly during this Lenten time. Going to begin today by looking at the first reading, which offers, remember that I mentioned that <clears throat> the first readings are generally concerned with covenants that God has or made with the Hebrew people. As we saw the first week, a covenant with Noah. As we saw last time, a covenant with Abraham. And now we come to the most uh, significant of covenants in the Old Testament, the Sinai Covenant, a covenant entered by Israel with God during their journey years through the wilderness. Now, to set things in place, what is important is that as the Israelites are coming out of Egypt, remember under the ages of Moses, there have been a series of plagues or wonders which released the people from Egypt. There has been the famous crossing or parting of the sea, and now they come to Mount Sinai. And here, the covenant with God is established. It really has three parts, as you remember. First, and every covenant has to have some terms, so <clears throat> the terms of the covenant are given when Moses climbs Mount Sinai, and there God communicates with uh, Moses, says, I want to make a covenant with this people. Here are the terms. Very simple, really, although I'm boiling it down a little bit. I will be your God, says uh, the Lord, and you will be my people. That's the, the agreement. Do you agree with that? Well, Moses now has to present this case to the people, comes down, makes the, uh, uh, gives the terms of the uh, covenant arrangement. Israel agrees, so that's part one. Part two is a ritual. Moses then has an altar erected in, uh, at the foot of Mount Sinai. He has the young men fill bowls with the blood of uh, animals, probably sheep, which would have been uh, part of the herd that Israel was taking with it, interestingly, through the uh, uh, years there in the wilderness. Then at a certain point in time, Moses takes that bowl of blood, blood, remember, being the fundamental sign of life. And also, this will be how to seal the covenant. Moses takes uh, the blood, Half of it he sprinkles over the altar, representing God's presence, and half of it sprinkled over the people. You can imagine how they felt about that, but it was therefore the ritual by which the covenant with God was established. That's part two. Part three now is how are we going to live out this covenant? And Moses now goes up to the, up the mountain again, Mount Sinai, or in another tradition is called Mount Horeb, same mountain, different names, and receives what sometimes we call the commandments, but really which in the Hebrew are the 10 words. <clears throat> These would be the guidelines for Israel carrying out uh, its relationship with, uh, with God. Now, the section that we hear this time are the Exodus version of the famous words. There is a second account, very similar, which is found in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 5. So there's two places where these 
famous words are given. Now, in fact, this, uh, although we just get the 10 words which serve as a kind of guideline, the whole series of laws and commandments begins um, with this chapter here, Exodus 20, and runs all the way through for the rest of the book of Exodus, all the way through the book of Leviticus, and until the 10th chapter of the book of Numbers. So there are a number of uh, rules and guidelines that are offered besides the famous words. Now we call them the Ten Commandments. They are not technically a law code, but they are a designation of the spirit that underlies all of the rules and regulations that uh, will follow. Something interesting to notice here is we call them the Ten Commandments, and we have a numbering. When you read them in the book of Exodus, you will notice that there are no numberings. That leads to an interesting arrangement over, uh, over the years. Uh, different communities number these 10 words in a different fashion. So for example, in the Jewish tradition, verses two is the first commandment, verses three and four are the uh, next commandments. Well, then we have uh, the Christians and they arrange it differently. We begin with verse three of the, uh, of the listing here and call that the first word and then uh, uh, four and six, that is verses, become the second word. And this is the way or the arrangement of the numbering of the commandments that was uh, followed by Josephus, one of the early, as you remember, the famous Hebrew uh, contributor in Jesus' time, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Calvin uh, tradition, and the Anglican tr tradition all count the commandments this way. Now notice what will happen here. You have two, three, four, five, six, so that when you are looking in this tradition, just to take an example, the fourth commandment is, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Wait a minute, you shake your head. Isn't that honor your father and your mother? Yes, that's because we follow another tradition followed, by the way, by the Roman Catholics and also by most of the Lutheran traditions of numbering it uh, a little differently so that we uh, take, uh, and this gets <laughs> very interesting only when you watch on television and they will say, as it says in the fourth commandment, well, see, Catholics blink and say, oh, all right, but uh, other traditions will look at it in a different way. So if you like all of this stuff, just notice how does it work out? Well, the commandments are all off until you get down to the last one. And so in the Catholic tradition, we have the ninth commandment, don't cover your wife's your neighbor's wife. Tenth commandment, don't cover your neighbor's goods. In the earlier tra or the tradition followed by other ways, nine and 10 all make the last, for, uh, for them, make the last commandment. So in the end, everybody has 10 words, all right? So I go into all of that just as a little bit of a background to how the counting of these words uh, take place. Now basically, and remember that Moses is pictured as receiving two tablets, uh, tablets of stone, after all, it's kind of colorful, and there was even a, 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 an occasion when, when Moses, uh, just to kind of flesh out a little bit where this story went, when Moses came down with these 10 words, find that the Israelites, because they have missed him for 40 days, have turned to uh, something else, namely worshiping a golden calf. Moses gets a little ticked off and smashes the commandments. So he has to go up and get a second set. So all that's a little bit of uh, of a background. So what do these commandments really, or what do these words uh, indicate? The first set, and this is what I started to say, there are really two sets. One deal with the relationship of God to God, and the second set deals with the relationship to neighbors. So let's follow 
because we're more familiar with this, let's follow the Roman tradition or the Lutheran tradition and say that the first three commandments or words deal with relationships to God. The rest of them deal with relationships to uh, neighbor. <clears throat> so what does it say? <clears throat> Maybe just uh, briefly to look at each of them to see what their importance were. And by the way, <clears throat> although these commandments are pictured as being given to Moses on Mount Sinai as the Israelites are getting ready to continue their journey, the most likely uh, explanation of this is that these commandments were written much later uh, in Israelites' history, after they had already settled on the land and began to develop relationships. And in order to make them important from the very beginning, therefore are jettisoned back to the time of Moses, and Moses is pictured and this is one of his most important titles, you remember, as the great lawgiver, okay? So the first forbids the worship of other gods. Please uh, pay attention to this. Notice that at this point, whenever this set of uh, decalogue, we call it the decalogue, was put into place, that this is not monotheism, that there is only one God. This is called, there is another technical word here, henotheism, namely that Israel is to remember their God is the God among all the other gods. And at a certain point, Israel will say, our God, in fact, is Lord over the other gods. But at this point, Israel is reminded of their God. This is the God. What kind of God is this who has freed them from slavery in Egypt, led them uh, into the wilderness and is promising to bring them into a land of their own. So therefore, this is a very powerful commandment. I will not have any other devotion to the gods to take place. Only the Lord God is your God and him alone shall you worship and I will have no idols before me. So this is part of the uh, commandment here, the forbidding of idols. Don't make them, don't bow down to them, don't worship them, no images. God will, and the God of Israel will remain imageless, except of course, going back to the Genesis story, where let us create humankind to our own image and likeness. But if you look for the image of God, you find it in human beings, but I will not have pictures of me or statues of me to be worshiped. So the God of Israel will always remain kind of mysterious and um, you, you can't put your hands around God or you put God in God's place, see? And so that's very important. And that's what this commandment or this first word um, is all about. Also was saying, and, and, and even kind of uses human language here, that God is going to be jealous, divine jealousy, if you have any kind of illicit relationship with the other gods. So it is that exclusiveness that um, is being asked. And then the, the third part of this uh, uh, little section, as we look at it, is do not use the divine name for, and, and basically um, when you go into court or something like that, because to have the name is to have both power and responsibility. And I will not have my name used in that way, says, uh, says the Lord. So we sometimes say don't swear. Well, it, it, you, that's not what it's about, okay? Uh, it's not swearing, but it is saying, don't use my name f without great responsibility and great respect. So there's obviously going to be development of these commandments as time goes on. The next word has to do with the Sabbath observance. And this is a very important part of, as we have mentioned earlier on in one of our talks, a very important development within he the Hebrew tradition, namely the Sabbath, which is the seventh day, 
is to be a day of rest, a day in which the ordinary activities of life are not carried on except those which are necessary. Now, it doesn't specifically prohibit what you aren't to do, but it is to say that it is to be a, a day of, of rest. The reason for this, and here is where there's a slight difference between the arrangement of the words found in the book of Deuteronomy and <clears throat> the words found in the book of Exodus. As we will hear this week, the reason for keeping the Sabbath is that this rem remembers God's creation, that God created in six days and rested on the seventh. So that is the rationale for the Sabbath. In the Deuteronomic tradition, the rationale for the Sabbath is that we honor this because we remember that God led us out of Egypt, freed us from slavery there, and brought us to a new land. And so that's the reason why we observe the Sabbath. So there are pretty much uh, similarities, rather great similarities between the two codes, but here is one area where there's a difference, namely in explaining the reason for that. The next uh, set now, that's the first set, however you count it, <laughs> begins with honor your, your father and your mother. It is the one uh, word or commandment that has a promise, so that uh, namely that you will live long in the land. And as you may know, the reason for this commandment is not that our parents, or kids rather, should be respectful to their parents, but it's how the middle-aged take care of their parents. It is a, a command that is basically concerned with making sure that the elderly, that those who move on in life and sometimes are not able to do all of the things that they could do when they were younger, are now taken care of. So that's the original purpose of this, uh, of honor your mother and your father. The next is, <clears throat> thou shalt not kill. Well, kill is not the right word here. It really means thou shalt not murder, because obviously a lot of killing has gone on and continues to go on. It really isn't a prohibition strictly against war, because there were wars to carried on, but murder, which is, now what's, what's important here is <clears throat> that all of these next words help build or defend community. Because if every time I get angry or get, you know, pissed off at somebody and I decide, well, I'm just going to do them in, uh, where would community be? Where, how, how would we keep things kind of structured safely? So therefore, you see, I'm going to suggest that these words are always very practically uh, brought it to bear. So do not murder. Do not take the life of a fellow Hebrew. Uh, it also would be extended beyond the Hebrew community, but basically here it's seen as a community builder. Next, <clears throat> do not commit adultery. Well, adultery, of course, technically is not, by the way, against premarital sex or anything like that, despite the way in which sometimes it will be used, but it's against the fact that when a man, and unfortunately his spouse was considered to be his property, when a man, and this would be especially important when we remember that <clears throat> much of Israel was also dependent on shepherding as well as farming, but shepherding was important for many, many uh, years, even in Jesus' time, <clears throat> went something like this. If a man were married, so uh, he then, uh, he was a shepherd, and at a certain point in time, <clears throat> Uh, would have to go out with the sheep for maybe two, three months sometimes and, and to be away. Well, when Mrs. whatever was at home, uh, sometimes a neighbor down the street who kind of looked and liked her came and kept the home fires burning in that tent, but in a way that was violating a man's unfortunate term here, property, his wife. So when he found out, when he came back, <clears throat> and uh, you know, Mrs. said, you know, while you were gone, what was happening? He then would say to the community, <clears throat> this, I, I'm not gonna shepherd anymore because when I go away, my wife is being uh, taken advantage of or taking advantage of someone else. Remember, adultery technically has to do with one who is married 
uh, <clears throat> one of the partners having to do with uh, either another married person or, <clears throat> excuse me, an unmarried person. So the commandment is to protect Simon, who's the shepherd, from Sammy, who's the neighbor, who's having an affair with Sarah, uh, just to use the illustration, says, no, you can be assured that when you do the work of being shepherding, your wife will stay and will remain faithful. Thou shalt not commit adultery. See in there, and so there would be a terrible penalty paid for the violation of that. What I'm just suggesting again is the practicality of this. The next uh, commandment uh, talks about stealing. Basically, we suspect that this really meant kidnapping, namely taking advantage of uh, somebody else's. And again, here isn't this a sad thought that another person might be considered the property of someone. So. Uh, uh, stealing then, of course, begins to be uh, extended to not only the taking of a person, but also taking of a person's property. Again, it protects the community. It means <clears throat> that for those days, you didn't have to lock your door every time you left the house or the tent because you knew that this uh, kind of rule or guideline was in place. False testimony is the next of the words. Uh, this, <clears throat> in the ancient world, you were presumed uh, guilty until you could prove that you were innocent. Now, in our culture, we seem to argue the other way around. You are presumed innocent until proved guilty. But I'm not so sure when you pay attention to the news at times whether or not the opposite isn't, uh, isn't the case. But therefore, Swearing, specifically, as I mentioned earlier on, has nothing to do, everything to do, rather, with what goes on in court. It does not have to do with, on, you know, language, bathroom language or that, which doesn't mean we shouldn't use that, but that isn't technically what swearing is. Swearing is saying, literally, when I say something on behalf of God, it is true, but where do you do that fundamentally in court? And the final commandments, whether you do nine or 10 or, or 10, depending on how you arrange it, has to do with covenant. Now there's a great deal of uh, discussion over what the word covenant, covenant means. Uh, it could, I covet something, could be desirous, could be delightful, or could be the, and, and this is where the commandment re, uh, word rather gets a little strong, the act of planning to do something. I may be thwarted in actually carrying it out, like so, for maybe I plan to rob a bank, but on the day that when I come into the bank, there are three policemen standing around, I decide not to do it <laughs> for my own sake. But coveting has the idea that I'm plotting to do it and, uh, and, and therefore don't do that, whether it be someone else's wife, somebody else's property, uh, or, and, and uh, Property could be animals. Unfortunately, properties could be uh, persons. Uh, <clears throat> as an aside here, as we saw, slavery was simply a fact of the ancient world, and so that is not argued against here. So that, uh, taking a bit of time, is the background for the famous 10 words. Now, as I mentioned, the, whole, the rest of the book of Exodus, the whole book of Leviticus, and the early part of the book of Numbers spells out specific cases where those 10 words are to be applied. So if you're looking for a Lenten uh, opportunity to learn a lot, you could uh, check all of those things out. Otherwise, well, and these are the terms, and that's how we got onto this, these are the terms of the co covenant in the sense that it will help one carry out or live out, or, and therefore maybe the better <clears throat> word for these 10 words is the guidelines how truly <clears throat> to be community. Well, in a certain way, those are just as applicable for us as they were then. <clears throat> the gospel pictures the story of Jesus being in the temple. Now this uh, follows, this is the opening of chapter two in John's gospel. 
In chapter 1, it concluded with Jesus being at Cana of Galilee, where he had uh, been connected with changing the water into wine. He now comes to Jerusalem, and in John's Gospel, he comes to the temple uh, at Passover time. In John's Gospel, Jesus appears in Jerusalem three different Passovers, and so for today, we'll simply mention that it was an important event uh, for the Jewish community, usually celebrated in the early part of the calendar year, sometime between March and uh, April. Uh, so, for example, this year, uh, the Passover in the Jewish tradition is celebrated on March the 27th, 28th, and concludes on April 4th, which happens to be Easter Sunday for us. That's just a little aside. We'll talk about the Passover a bit uh, more at other times. Now, as Jesus comes into the temple, <clears throat> he is pictured here as being angry at his, what is going on in the temple. Now, you will notice that the temple area here that we have spoken about and will, I think in the past, talked about the fact that it was known as Herod's temple, um, a work that had been got, begun during the time of King Herod the Great, about the year 2019, before the Common Era, <clears throat> and in fact, was not really totally completed until <clears throat> the year 64 of the Common Time. But at the time in which Jesus may, well, and certainly was there, about 10 years after the process had begun, major developments within the context of the temple area had taken place. Jesus, <clears throat> this event, by the way, is also narrated in the synoptics, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but they picture this as happening during Holy Week, namely right after Jesus' entrance to the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. But John presents this as happening very early in the time of Jesus' Um, ministry. You remember the fact that Jesus comes up to Jerusalem for three Passovers is why we generally determine that Jesus' public ministry lasted three, time, three years, rather, because he came up three times for the Passover. He um, here seems to be opposed to what is going on by the leaders of the Jewish community. The term Jews is here used for the first time in John's Gospel. We have mentioned in earlier discussions to be very careful about how that term, the Jews, is used. Most likely it refers to the temple leadership, which would have been an exclusive group of Jews, not the whole of Judaism itself. And that's always important uh, to notice. Jesus here uh, traces out, it's the only Gospel where he uses a whip, to chase out uh, those who are buying and selling there. Could have been, uh, obviously, it was all right to do that. So why is Jesus disturbed? Um, well, because he says, you have turned my father's house, my, the dwelling of my father, into a marketplace. His disciples later on in reflecting will say, look, zeal for Jesus, for the house of God, consumed Jesus, and that's what motivated him uh, to do this. What is important, and perhaps why it's brought to our attention here during the Lenten time, is that Jesus, when confronted by the leadership, will say, uh, give us a sign of why you're doing this. And this uh, understanding of sign, again, we will speak of this a little more when we come to John in the future. Um, <clears throat> Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Well, now, immediately, the Gospel writer says, and, and he steps back here, and it's important that the, a narrator voice occurs in verses 21 and 22, that the temple that Jesus is talking about is not a building, but the temple of his body. That destroy this, namely, it's a premonition of his coming death, but in three days, I will rebuild it or I will rise again. So this is really a, a, a kind of indication of what is going, going to happen. And I suspect that that is why this particular gospel 
is chosen for our reflection today. It anticipates the coming passion and death of Jesus. But <clears throat> it is important uh, to see that uh, here, uh, by the way, the, there are little dynamics that are different in the way in which uh, uh, the uh, driving out, if you want, by the way, it drives out the um, uh, money changers the, and, and the, the, the birds, which are, in, uh, <laughs> which are in cages. You can't <laughs> let the birds go, so you have to drive out the cages and all of that. So uh, I kind of suggest that there's a lot going on here in this particular uh, gospel, but keep in mind that the dwelling place, the building that Jesus refers to has two understandings. One, the temple of Herod, we'll talk about this uh, at, at another time, and that's one building, but the other building is the temple of place of Jesus, the dwelling place of the spirit and the dwelling place where God also lives and dwells with us due to the call of our baptism. Thank you very much. Hope to see you again.